Most of us know what it's like to have something taken away because someone bigger or someone more powerful than us used their power or their position in life to get what they wanted. It's kind of like the schoolyard bully who takes lunch money from the kids. You know, that's still a thing, but it's not just the kids who are stealing the money. Some adults are doing it as well. Take, for example, what recently happened in the well-off town of New Canaan, Connecticut. That town has, or that's, that school system is one of the best in the state of Connecticut. But in recent years, a scandal was brewing. Someone was taking the children's lunch money, but not in the way that you might imagine. The money was being stolen after the kids paid for their meals. Apparently, cash was dis- disappearing from the cafeteria registers at both the high school and the middle school. But school officials were unaware of this problem for a number of years. From 2012 to 2017, a half million dollars went missing. This crime was finally solved at the beginning of this past school year when the New Canaan Police Department announced that it had arrested two people. They were sisters. These two sisters had worked together in the cafeteria system, and since they both had access to cash registers, they used that opportunity to take what wasn't theirs. In my book, that's a prime example of not only doing the wrong thing, but of a person abusing the power that they have. This is also what we find happening in our scripture passage from 1 Kings. It's a story of power being abused in the worst kind of way. And it's a story that illustrates for us the 10th commandment, the commandment against coveting something that belongs to another person. Now, the real danger of coveting what isn't yours is that it leads people to do some very unsavory things to get what they want. They will lie and cheat and in some cases steal And even murder. These are awful, awful things. And people end up doing these things because they put other priorities ahead of God. What they covet has become more valuable to them than the Lord. So coveting is really just a form of idolatry. Now our scripture story opens with King Ahab wintering at his southern palace in Jezreel, which sat at a lower altitude than the capital of Samaria. This was a a pleasant location to get away from the colder winter weather. It's where the snowbirds might go. And while Ahab was there, he noticed the vineyard adjacent to his palace, and he wanted it for himself. So the king found the owner of that vineyard, a man named Naboth, And he proposed a deal. Ahab was willing to give him a nicer plot of land in exchange for that vineyard. And if he wasn't interested in land, the king was happy to give him cold, hard cash. First glance, the king's offer looks really generous. But a closer look reveals something darker and more devious. For one thing... Ahab had already owned two palaces, and yet he wasn't satisfied. He wanted more. He wanted his neighbor's land for a vegetable garden. Now, this little detail seems rather harmless until we realize that 1 Kings is making a subtle point about Ahab's motivation. See, the term vegetable garden appears only in one other place in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 10 and 11. In that passage, the natural fertile land promised to Israel is contrasted with the land of the Egyptians. Now the Egyptians had to water their vegetable gardens. It required irrigation. But the vineyards in Israel thrived naturally. No irrigation was required. 
And throughout the Old Testament, we also see that vineyards are a symbol of God's blessing to the Israelites. Israel is even referred to as a vineyard. The implication here is that Ahab's plan of converting Naboth's vineyard into a vegetable garden was a way of rejecting the blessing that God had placed on the land and on the people of Israel. And this point is reinforced by Naboth's refusal to accept the king's deal. In verse 3, Naboth said, The Lord forbid that I should give you my ancestral inheritance. Now, Israelite law stipulated that ancestral lands must stay within the clan as a way of maintaining the integrity of tribal territories and to keep the land from being sold to foreigners. Naboth was simply the caretaker of his family's land, of his family's ancestral property. And unlike Ahab, he was satisfied with what he already had. And he realized that the land that he was in possession of was really just a gift from God. And in a very real sense, it still belonged to God. That's why he refused to accept Ahab's offer. And once that happened, the king became depressed. He went home, laid down on his bed, and then turned his face to the wall whenever people spoke to him or offered him food. That's when Jezebel entered the story. She was determined at all costs to get Naboth's vineyard for her husband. But she didn't want to do this in a direct way where everyone would see her actions. Rather, she devised a rather cunning and devious plan. She had Ahab call for a religious fast and then had Naboth seated at the head of the assembly. That's the, the place of honor. Jezebel then had two scoundrels bring charges against Naboth that he had cursed God and cursed the king. Now the law required that there be two witnesses to confirm a crime. As you can see, Naboth was being set up. He was being framed and condemned for treason, and for blasphemy. He had actually done the opposite. He had respected the law. He honored God and kept the law. Unlike Ahab and Jezebel, who just used and abused the legal system to get what they wanted. Now Jezebel's plan worked, and Naboth was taken out and stoned to death. And when Jezebel boastfully reported this news to her husband, Ahab immediately went out and took possession of the vineyard for himself. There was nothing to stop him. Nothing except the word of the Lord. Now the Lord had seen this miscarriage of justice and would work to set things right. God worked through the prophet Elijah to deliver this word to Ahab. Now, Elijah forcefully communicated to the king God's opposition to this unjust and arrogant use of power against a weaker member of society. And according to this scripture passage, as I understand it, injustice is not simply an offense against God against human beings. It's an offense against God. And so the Lord intervened on behalf of Naboth. Now the good news is that unjust powers will not have the last word in our broken world. The truth will eventually prevail. God raises up prophets and people of faith to speak the truth so that innocent people won't be forgotten. Innocent people of faith are, are encouraged and really uh, are led by the Lord to speak up for those who can't speak, for those who have suffered. God uses God's people to intervene on behalf of those who've been treated unjustly and oppressed. God works to bring justice to those who need it. Now the work of justice is to be a part of God's work. We aren't called to sit 
sits idly, idly by, we can use the power that we have to make a difference. Now, I realize that uh, some of us feel like we don't have all that much power, and truth is there are some people who have a lot more power than we do. But let's remember that we do have a sphere of influence, and we can use the power that we have to help others and to look after the weak. We can use the power that we have to share the love of God. A man named Aaron Fuerstein is an example of this. He's a businessman. And he's done very well for himself as a CEO. He's been the CEO of a textile uh, firm up in New Jersey. But a big tragedy hit his company in 1995 when his Malden Mills factory burnt down. Now the 3,000 people who were employed there were immediately out of work. It was a terrible situation. Those employees worried about how they would pay the, the mortgage or the rent. They worried about how they would put food on the table for their family and pay the bills. Mr. Fuerstein responded to this disaster in a way that you might not expect out of a CEO. Now we might think of CEOs as being primarily interested with the bottom line, but not him. He decided to keep all 3,000 employees on the payroll as the factory was being rebuilt. He didn't have to do that. The law didn't require it, but he did. He believed it was the right thing to do because he had a responsibility to his employees and to the community. And he said he acted in this way because of his faith in God. He was in a position of power, and he used that position to help a great number of people. And what happened after that factory was rebuilt and got up and running again is pretty remarkable because it tripled its business. God calls on us to use the power we have to help people. Now, sometimes that means we need to stand up for people who've been treated in unjust ways. Sometimes it means we have to help those who aren't in a position to help themselves. You know, bosses can use their power to strengthen their employees. Teachers can use their power to strengthen their students. Parents can use their power to strengthen their children. Unfortunately, this is not how King Ahab acted. He wasn't interested in strengthening Naboth. Now, people in power who use their authority to coerce or manipulate or bully others can get what they want. But it's only because of the position they hold. They may appear strong, but they're actually weak and insecure, which was the case with Ahab. Now contrast this to people who appear weak but are actually quite strong. It's like when someone says something mean to us, some nasty comment, and everything within us wants to strike back with an even nastier comment. But we refuse to do so. We hold our tongue. Now it may look like we lost may look like someone walked right over us. But we, what we did took tremendous strength. And I think it takes even more strength to forgive that kind of person and to, uh, to love them. Now that's exactly how Jesus lived. At the end of his life, he was framed for a crime, he was tortured, and he was murdered. To an observer... It looked like he lost. And yet, even in the midst of all that, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, there are times in life when we will find ourselves on the receiving end of something unjust. We may have to endure some awful things. We may even suffer. But because of our faith in God, we can live with hope. By remembering what God has done in the past and by trusting that God's justice will prevail. We can remember that good overcomes evil, mercy overcomes pain, and even at the end, 
life overcomes death, we can remember that God is a God who intervenes. That's the promise of the cross. And that's a theme that runs throughout the whole of Scripture. God has promised to never leave or forsake the weaker members of society. God willingly intervenes on behalf of the downtrodden and those abused. It can be disheartening to see acts of injustice. It's disheartening to see the pain created by it. And yet today's scripture encourages us to not give up or lose heart when we find ourselves in that kind of predicament. We can trust that God sees what is happening and is working through people to bring justice. Now humans may do things that thwart the purposes of God, but in the end, God will prevail because God is working to set things right. God is a God who intervenes. And thanks be to God for that. Would you pray with me? Lord, it's easy to get discouraged by some of the things we see in the world. We see many acts of injustice and immorality. We see people hurting each other. We even see people in power abusing the power they have. But we are grateful that you see what's happening. And we trust that your justice will prevail. And we pray that you might use us to help in this work. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll sing our hymn of response in just a minute. It's hymn number 392. As we sing, I'll be at the front of the sanctuary to receive any who want to come forward. Uh, This is a time to receive prayer. It's a time to share a decision that you are making for God with the church family. But I want to invite you now to, to stand and let's sing together hymn number 392.